Thank you for that. Good morning, everyone, on a Friday, another Friday, 10 a.m. <laughs> um, you might notice that uh, it's actually read uh, on the screen there as 82 because I stuffed up. Uh, I think last week I said it was number 80. It was actually 81. So this is uh, session 82 for Connect and Shares with Outdoors New South Wales and ACT. For those that don't know, I'm Laurie Mode. I am your Chief Executive Officer and I'm accompanied by the beautiful Leslie Bowen and Helen Cooper, who are also doing some magnificent work uh, with Outdoors. And to our members, welcome. Thank you for joining us again, whether you're live or on recording. Uh, we welcome you and thank you for being here because this is why we do these sessions. It's all for you. So first of all, may I acknowledge the traditional owners on their lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to all elders past, present and emerging. And may we learn from their expertise, their experience and their knowledge of the lands that we use <laughs> as our tool every day uh, in what we do with adventurous activities. So let me uh, quickly jump in, uh, just remind everyone, as I do at the start of every year, why Outdoors New South Wales ACT exists. And it's about advocacy, it's about promotion, education and connecting the industry. And we do that in many different ways. And I've spent the week in, in the ACT this week, um, certainly connecting, um, advocating, promoting the sector widely and uh, hopefully assisting with some of the members in um, educating about some of the opportunities that exist in the industry. A big reach out to our supporters, our funders, our Office of Sport New South Wales. Uh, thanks to Patty Pallon for coming on board for some of the programs that we're offering this year, as well as the funding partner for the Active Outdoor Kids program, the AC, uh, sorry, the Australian Government and the New South Wales Government. And I can't forget the Small Business Month, which is just around the corner. And I'll talk more about our mentoring program, which is coming up as of the 1st of March. But some really important information that I need to uh, reiterate. I know last year we talked about Child Safe and, and the scheme that's coming into place. It is now in place. So as of the 1st of February, by law, all child safe organisations, oh sorry, child um, organisations have to abide by these new standards. Um, so don't be overwhelmed. Uh, the Office of Sport have been really great in supplying content uh, to help guide you and your thinking within the organisation. And uh, I'll go through the standards very quickly today and just reiterate um, some of the things that you've got to think about when you're looking at this. Uh, I'm pleased to be on the Recre uh, Sport and Recreation Sector Engagement Committee, so you will see uh, a few more people from the Office of, of um, Children's Guardian coming to some of our events and uh, being there to answer any questions, but also giving more insight into how to uh, be compliant in this area. Now, if you want more information, certainly scan that QR code. It will take you to the website that has all the information on offer. But just to reiterate, 1st of February was the date. This is now legal and it's a requirement of anyone that works with children within their business. So um, I'll just quickly jump to the standards. Uh, that is the document which we can certainly send you or guide you to, which is on the, uh, the Children's Guardian website but reminding you that there's 10 standards they want you to look at and embed into your practices the first one is child safety is embedded into your leadership governance and of course your culture within your organization um, I'm not going to go through all this I just wanted to reiterate what we should be doing and that is that the organization makes a public commitment now that's through your marketing through your terminology through engagement with your staff around championing child safe culture culture. Uh, risk management plans focus on that uh, and staff understand their obligations in regards to reporting, sharing that information and keeping good records. So that's uh, standard one. Standard two is children participate in the decisions that are affecting them and taking it seriously. So what should we be doing? Children are able to express their views and provide opportunities to participate and affect their lives. The importance of friendships is recognised and children can access abuse prevention programs and information. Staff are attuned to the signs of harm and facilitate child-friendly ways to communicate and raise their concerns. 
Uh, the third standard is around families and communities being informed and involved also. So again, what should we be doing? Making sure that the organisation engages in a two-way conversation with the families uh, and the communities that um, are involved in your programs. Chart standard four is about equity, being held up high with diverse needs and taken in, into account. So what should we be doing? The organisation is actively anticipating children's diverse circumstances. All children have access to information, are supported and have a, a good complaint process. The organisation pays particular attention to the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, children with a disability and called backgrounds. So that's culturally and linguistic diverse backgrounds. So standard five is about people working with, with children that um, are suitable and supported. So again, what should we be doing? Recruitment, including advertising and screening emphasizes your child safety culture. Relevant staff checks, probity checks, all staff receive appropriate induction and are aware of their responsibilities. And that goes to the reporting guidelines. So if you remember, this came out of the Royal Commission and the reporting obligations were highly uh, identified as something that needed um, extreme uh, change. Supervision and people management um, must have a child safety focus. Standard six goes to your processes to respond to complaints. Um, so what should we be doing? The organisation has a child-focused complaint handling system. The organisation has effective complaint handling that clearly outlines the roles and responsibilities of staff, stakeholders, the actual people involved in the complaint. And the complaints are taken seriously, responded promptly and thoroughly. The organisation meets reporting privacy and employment obligations. Getting there, we're only up to, uh, we've already got uh, four more. So standard seven, staff are equipped with the knowledge, skills and awareness to keep children safe. So this goes to your professional development processes with your staff. And what should we be doing? Receiving training on the nature and indications of child um, maltreatment, particularly abuse that occurs in, in organisations. That uh, regular training, that regular update, regular information that you uh, communicate to your, your um, employees is incredibly important. And staff are supported about practical skills when responding to certain disclosures. Standard eight, physical and online environments minimise the opportunity for abuse or other kinds of harm. So what should we be doing? Risks in online and physical environments are identified, mitigated without compromising the child's right to privacy. The online environment is used in accordance with the organisation's code of conduct. Standard nine, implementation of the child safety standards is continuously reviewed and improved. So like all of your processes and procedures that you have in your organisation, these two should be reviewed frequently. So we review, um, we improve, and uh, we also analyze complaints and see where any sy systematic failures might have occurred. And standard 10, the final one there is policies and procedures document on how the organization is child safe. So as we do in risk management, in employment procedures, it's bringing this into the fold of good policies and procedures to guide child safe practices. Um, best practice models and stakeholder consultation is a, is a great way to do that and leaders champion and model compliance with policies and procedures. You've got to make sure that staff understand and implement those policies and procedures as well. So look, I went through them really, really quickly, but what I uh, will say is the children, Office of Children's Guardian have made this very user-friendly for our industry and anyone in sport and recreation. I encourage you to have a look at the document. I've only given you a snapshot of probably around 10% of the document. It gives you practical examples of, of how to look at it. And uh, as Outdoors New South Wales ACT is on that stakeholder engagement uh, work, working group, uh, we can certainly bring more opportunity for uh, ch Children's Guardian to come to you and answer any queries you may have. If there's any uh, queries on that, please jump in and ask. Otherwise, we will continue on for um, 
the rest of the content. And just to say that ACT has actually passed some legislation in regards to the response to the Royal Commission. It was done in 2018 and then further response on the 1st of September 19 about the reporting guidelines. Uh, I haven't seen anything over recent times, but certainly this will give you the access to their recommendations in, re in uh, any businesses that are located within the Australian Capital Territory. They look at eight different areas. Uh, that's independent oversight, mandatory reporting, reportable conduct schemes, uh, information sharing, record keeping, student information sharing, teacher registration and carers regulation. Touches very similarly on some of the areas of New South Wales, but uh, I, the information here is available on that website on the QR code on the previous page. If you need any more content, we'll happy to share it to you. So a big congratulations to our Hugh Sutherland uh, from, well, Blue Mountains, but New South Wales Young Achiever of the Year that was announced last night. Well done, Hugh. Thanks, Laurie. <laughs> Pleasure. And I think uh, for everyone's viewing pleasure, I'm going to give you a search <laughs> what you said last night. So oh, I <laughs> can't wait to watch this. <laughs> <laughs> I thought yeah, that. I think I made the people in the control room laugh at them. <laughs> Nothing to laugh at. I'm dead no, serious. No, yes. well, that's, you know, so yeah. the next award is? I had the experience. The Young Achiever Award recognises an individual who is under 35 years of age and whose work in the tourism industry contributes to the development of a vibrant and professional industry. The recipient of the 2021 award is Hugh Sutherland. For over 10 years, Hugh has guided countless adventures and now moving into instructional roles, he's instilling high standards of skill and ethics into our next generation. He volunteers countless hours outside of his work commitments for the betterment of the industry, including his role as a state representative and course coordinator of the Australian Climbing Instructors Association. Hugh has led a collective industry discussion to improve broader outdoor industry issues at a state and national level, compiling research and evidence to assist in the improvement of pay and conditions, compliance of laws and regulations, risk assessment and environmental management. Hugh is a passionate outdoor guide and educator. He's a credit to himself, the Blue Mountains and the outdoor adventure industry. Congratulations, Hugh. Thank you very much, and it's um, a real big honour to receive this award, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone involved in putting this on. Um, I'd really like to thank um, the people sitting next to me who have nominated me for this award and put me here today, and my partner, Claire, as well, who's um, stood by me in countless hours of like putting in my time into um, the industry that I'm really passionate about. Um, I'd also really like to thank everyone who over the years has put me where I am today, um, who I've worked with um, and helped me just be the best um, guide and um, outdoor person I can. Um, I'd also just like to say that although this is an individual award, um, because I've got this award for um, researching the industry and putting some data together, this award is really for the um, adventure tourism industry and all of the people that work countless hours and um, yeah this award is for them as well so yeah it's a really great honour to receive this and yeah thank you very much again. Now I suspect you've actually got quite a bright future ahead of you you clearly worked so hard for this award tonight um, can you tell us what your next aspirations are? Yeah sure so to keep doing what I love, like teaching people and working outdoors, but also to keep spending time working for the fellow guys in the industry, improving their conditions so that they can go to work and enjoy doing what they love and want to be there and spend time doing that and just um, keep growing as a, as a guide and for a campaigner for my fellow guides as well. I've been fortunate enough to to do some climbing there in the Blue Mountains during my time with Sydney Weekend on Channel 7. And it, you really do have one of the most spectacular offices yeah, in the, office in the world. I mean, yeah, it's honestly, the, uh, the destination there for the Blue Mountains, what a credit that you are to the entire region. Um, think, would would you, you change much. it for anything? Give, give it a plug, mate. Give it a Blue Mountains. <laughs> yeah, like I love my job and it's a comment, comment, like people come and we take them 
take them out and it, it is the best office and the blue, the blue mountains is a beautiful place and i recommend everyone to come and check that out and um especially as you know we've been through years of like fires floods and and COVID, the more people we come up here um the better it is for everyone and some beautiful messages there and Hugh, what about just uh coming out the other side now in terms of outdoor adventure i know national parks have been receiving record numbers in terms of people going through those places what what do you see for the industry moving forward on the on the back of this um i see that we're coming through like a, a period of healing as an industry but also a chance for some big growth as well um and co coming together out of times of COVID and just getting more people coming and checking out the beautiful places and hopefully we can just keep building and um coming out of this time of the pandemic and getting more people out into the outdoors and adventuring well congratulations again Hugh no doubt you'll be celebrating the season yeah thank you very much well now out and, and did you <laughs> did you celebrate <laughs> Um, not, not, not too much. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we watched a bit of a climbing video and then, uh, had an early night pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And is there anything you have an opportunity to say more that you might've missed on the, on the speech last night, but, uh, yeah, watching that back, how was that for you? <laughs> um, I'm actually pretty happy with, with that. Um, not not a lot of preparation went into what I said there. Uh, it was one of the <laughs> oh, more articulate you know? responses to it. Yeah. All, I thought. No, I think the key thing that I wanted to say going in that it was, and I still feel, is that it's really more about what us as an industry can get out of this and yes. what we can take away. So it's not really just about me, but things about using this to keep growing and making sure that everyone can get something out of this opportunity. So good. And that's why you won the award. So well done. <laughs> yeah, congratulations again. And uh, yeah, certainly um, revel in, in that, that moment because, yeah, sometimes all the efforts we put in are sometimes thankless. So here's the thanks from the industry and, and thanks from, yeah, all of us within the outdoors community. Thanks, Laurie. Thank you very much. Yeah. So there was also some other awards which I'd like to mention uh, that were announced last night. And you can see on your screen there that there was various categories where the outdoors did shine as well. So the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tourism category, um, you might remember Mark Sadler came and joined us for NADOC week last year. He took out the silver awards with Bungie Cultural Tours, which uh, big congratulations to Mark and his team. He does an amazing job in Wagga and also to the guys in Coffs Harbour for their uh, their awards. In the retail and hire uh, service section, uh, Sydney Harbour Kayaks took out the gold. So well done, Shannon and the team there. Uh, Adventure Tourism, Let's Go Surfing took out the, the gong there and Beyond Blooming and Coffs uh, Skydivers were also recipients of the silver and the bronze awards. And the eco tourism category, Tweed Eco Cruises, uh, at Vision Walks Mullumbimby and Sydney by Kayak at Lavender Bay, all represented outdoor adventurous activities and put us on the state stage. The gold award winners actually now go through to the national awards. So we've all got our fingers crossed that we have some of those representing us even at the national stage. Um, tonight is the ACT Tourism Awards. So I can't tell you who won because it hasn't happened yet, but uh, it's online like uh, we had last night with the New South Wales Tourism Awards. But uh, a big good luck to Canberra Aqua Park, Dynamic Motivation and National Arboretum Canberra. Uh, we hope you come back with uh, some accolades and we can celebrate those as well. The mentoring program is a significant program that will help bring people like you and, uh, and others to a program that we can help develop their understanding or navigating their career pathway in the outdoors community. So I urge every single one of you to reach out to someone that you think could do more in the industry, who is 
passionate about what we do and uh, we can guide them through developing their career and keeping them within the outdoor community. So uh, it's now open. It starts on March 1st. So we haven't got much time to get all our mentors and mentorees in. If you want to be a mentor, we're also open to applications for that. Um, but we need more mentorees because uh, that's certainly where we need to make the biggest impact for our industry long term. So spread the word, please get them to sign up. And uh, that program will run from March through to September with some intense activity supported by Small Business Month in March. So um, yeah, get hopping and get registering on that one. Education update. So most of you know that New South Wales is fully open when it comes to outdoor education and school camps. I've spoken to many of you during the week and uh, as we predicted, we've struggled a little bit on the staffing levels with schools and that some of them are taking uh, the approach to possibly postpone uh, their the good thing is I'm not hearing too many cancellations. They are postponements, but I suppose the challenge now is getting them into a time frame that suits not only yourselves, but the school as well. Um, I'd love to hear from you about some of the conversations you're having with the schools and the new risk management um, plan templates that the Department of Education have uh, guided the schools with uh, to see how that's going. And, and obviously I can advocate on your behalf if there's any changes that are required there. But certainly I'm hearing that it's uh, as smooth as it can be at the moment in New South Wales. Unfortunately, ACT is not so lucky. At the moment, the health advice to the education directorate is to cease uh, ed, uh, outdoor education and school camps for term one. Now, that being said, I have spoken to many people this week to try to guide them in a thinking of reviewing that policy um, and certainly trying to uh, ensure that we can get our kids back to outdoor education. Um, as I said to one of the members of the Legislative Assembly this week, the kids can go to after school hours, outdoor recreation, but for some reason they can't do it between the hours of nine and three. So we need to ensure that we can get them into their programming, uh, support the small businesses of our own community that uh, make that happen and have this overturned as quickly as possible. But I will update as soon as I hear any change in that. Um, again, reach out to me if there's anything different that you're seeing or confirming what, uh, what we've heard so I can help guide where we can. A big reminder around the excursion offer. Um, you might remember that David Gregory has offered an amazing deal for AC, uh, New South Wales and ACT members of Outdoors to uh, sign up for their risk management programs at no cost. So you're looking at a, a value of $200 odd dollars uh, for these courses. And uh, because of what we've been through, uh, David has kindly offered these to us at no cost. So if you're interested, certainly email Leslie and she will put you in contact with the relevant people to get you signed off um, with these courses. Again, another reminder, and, it, and it's a crucial reminder when it comes to COVID-19 and the workforce within your organisation, remembering that positive workers must self-isolate immediately for seven days and then not to return to work until 24 hours after their symptoms. And the symptoms um, have been identified by the Department of Health as sore throat, runny nose, cough and shortness of breath. And they, they're not to come back until they have resolved in 24 hours after that. Up to three days after returning, it's encouraged that they continue to wear masks and keep from close contacts as much as possible. And be aware that COVID fatigue is a real result of catching COVID. So if you're wanting them to come back at 100% capacity, um, you need to be very mindful that that may not be the case. Uh, the pandemic leave payments are still there if there's no sick leave or options for financial assistance when they do have to isolate. Um, so make sure you help your, your uh, staff in guiding them in that area. And don't forget, you must notify uh, Safe Work if you, uh, if you believe that a, a worker has contracted COVID in the workplace and required hospitalisation. And that's by law. We need to do that. So uh, 
when we spoke with the Department of Education, they were really keen to understand what happens when a COVID case is on program. So I'm obviously talking about just education programs at this point. Uh, this is a reminder to what we recommend when it comes to uh, a COVID case being identified on program. So isolate the participant. And if, they, uh, if you have rat tests available or you have negotiated with the school to have rat tests available, uh, notify the close contact. Uh, that were with that person. The participant is removed from the program immediately, no questions. Whether it's cold, flu, COVID, whatever, it's still not good to be passing on any germs to, to anyone within the program. Uh, work with the school or the organising uh, body to coordinate that contacting of parent and guardian and picking up of that person from the program. If the rat tests are available, obviously you can conduct that and request uh, that from, um, from the parent if you don't have that uh, with you on immediate uh, departure from the program. And school to consider contacting the close contacts and advise of the suspected case. Um, and then you can see there the negative and positive um, approaches. So when I relate to the positive only, just isolate the group of close contacts, uh, school to contact the parent guardians for close contacts to be picked up. And that's of course, if you're able to identify that it is actually COVID. Nice to consider, I won't go through in, in full there, but uh, yeah, obviously this is about a relationship between your stakeholder, your, the person that has booked this group with you, um, and yourselves, and you need to work through that as a risk management procedure um, as best as possible so you have mutual ownership of that. Um, sending kids home that have COVID-like symptoms is not new. We know this. Uh, we deal with risk every day, and we have reiterated this uh, to our stakeholders to show that we are experienced in this area um, and to, to really have faith in what we provide as operators in the outdoors. Learnings from this week. So a big week. As I say, I was in Canberra, back-to-back uh, -back appointments pretty much for, for four days, um, making sure that uh, we did many different things. And I was obviously representing our members, um, our new members in, in everything that I spoke to anyone in government. Uh, I was also representing the Outdoor Council of Australia and trying to maximise our awareness in federal parliament um, as we loom closer to the inevitable election. Uh, also meeting the members and it was so great to see so many of you and, and thank you for coming out and, uh, and really giving me an insight into some of the challenges and opportunities that you see. But what I wanted to reiterate is the learnings from this week. And I think it's, it, it reiterates that we need to all be saying the same things when it comes to the benefits of outdoor adventurous activities. If we're singing the same song from the hymn sheep, as they say, um, people tend to hear it more. And I can be out there saying, you know, all of the outcomes, if it's not being replicated within the organisation, which most of the time it is, but if the staff aren't reiterating that, I encourage you all to em empower your staff to also communicate the benefits of outdoor adventurous activities. By a combined voice, we'll certainly get further. The second takeaway was certainly we need more up-to-date data. Um, we had some great studies done on the value of economics, uh, sorry, the value of outdoors in, in economic terms. Uh, we've got some great data on research of school camps and, and what that provided the kids. That research is now 2018, 2019, and we had this little thing called COVID since then. So we do need some up-to-date data. The data still stands, of course, in some way, shape or form, and we have to use that. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly what I've identified uh, going forward is we, we do need more up-to-date data. Um, the third thing is there, uh, I can't help you unless we know your challenges. And, and that was a, a beautiful takeaway from this week where I was told by a member about some of the challenges they were having in the parks and, and various access. Um, I was able to then meet with the Legislative uh, Council or Assembly and um, inform them about some of these challenges of which they were not aware. So I understand that you guys do not have the time and, and energy outside of your business 
chance to, to really connect with some of the power brokers or policy makers with your issues, that's why we're here. <laughs> so I encourage you to please let us know so I can take courage of your, your issues or your challenges or even your opportunities and help make sure that you have outcomes from that. And uh, the final thing there is, uh, I love that saying, people don't know what they don't know. So more conversations we have, more interactions we have. I'm so glad I went down there. Um, and uh, I have to say, probably the only challenge that I found is I got down there and then uh, Parliament House went into lockdown because of COVID. So most of my parliamentary meetings were on Zoom anyway. <laughs> but it was great to see our members and, uh, and really connect face to face, uh, particularly with the Chamber of Commerce as well, the Tourism Forum and, and our our members so thank you all for for meeting with me while we were down there so that's all the content for today so i'll happily um if you like we'll stop the recording and we'll open it up for conversation on anything that's on the top